Due to increased internet censorship, truth is under attack like never before. And the truth about the controlled demolitions of the World Trade Center towers on September 11th is just as important as it ever was. To stay updated on our work, make sure you visit ae911truth.org and subscribe to our email list. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can receive alerts when our videos are posted. No algorithm can silence the facts. By subscribing directly to us, you make it impossible for the censors to stand between you and the information you need to know. Visit ae911truth.org right now and stay connected. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Freefall. I am the host, Andy Steele, and tonight we are going to be joined by the one and only Craig McKee, who has a new article out on AE 9-11 Truth talking about COINTELPRO. What is that? That term gets thrown around in activist circles. People have ideas of what it means. We're going to be delving into it just as Craig's article does. Uh, But let me give him the formal introduction. Craig McKee has been a journalist in Montreal for more than 30 years and has uh, covered news and entertainment in that capacity. He's won eight provincial and national weekly newspaper awards. He is a writer at Truth and Shadows, as well as another blog called Thought Crimes and Misdemeanors. A lot of key information there. And he's also written for AE 9-11 Truth, including his latest article that we are going to be talking about in just... 30 seconds, if not sooner. Craig, welcome back to 9-11 Freefall. Hi, Andy. Thanks for having me back. Well, it's great to have you back, and you're doing a lot of great work with your research here. I believe that the information contained in this article is something that we need to revisit time and time again, because, you know, not everybody out there is uh, very genuine. A lot of very dishonest and uh, very sneaky people trying to cause problems, not just in the 9-11 truth movement, but any movement for change. And uh, how do we tolerate this in a supposedly free society? We'll be discussing that today. And I love the background. I was telling Craig before, now with with the darkness behind him, we literally have the truth (laughs) and the shadows here (laughs) on the screen portrayed to you. So <laughs> lighting is another way of putting it. <laughs> All right. So let's talk first about the word COINTELPRO. What does that stand for? What is it? Well, COINTELPRO uh, stands for Counterintelligence Program. And it was an FBI program that was started in 1956 by J. Edgar Hoover um, and uh, was discontinued officially in 1971. Although, um, like a lot of government programs that are discontinued, um, you know, I'm I'm quite certain that it just took a different form or they slapped a different name on it. And, uh, you know, there's no way that the government stopped surveilling uh, citizens, activist groups uh, in 1971, especially at that point that Vietnam War was still going on. So I'm sure the last thing they were interested in doing was, was, uh, stopping their efforts but officially uh they uh, they stopped it in 1971. so it's an fbi it's an fbi thing and it was largely i mean um uh in the 1960s it was really the focus of it the, they did they they surveilled a lot of a lot of activists but a lot of it was focused on on black groups black activist groups the black panthers and and other groups um and and individuals like like Martin Luther King, um, and uh, and even Muhammad Ali, who was uh, as most people know, uh, refused to go and fight in the Vietnam War and um, was imprisoned for it. Um, so it 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 really that was a major focus of the program uh, in the 1960s. 
but I've got a list here. I can just, uh, I'm just going to click on a file here because, you know, rather than depend on, on my memory entirely, but some of the, uh, the groups that were, uh, that were surveilled and disrupted, and I should, we, we'll get into the, I guess, the details of what the program actually did. But, um, but they, they did this with the Communist Party, with the American, in, American Indian Movement, Puerto Rican independence groups, feminist groups, the Ku Klux Klan, the Socialist Workers Party, the Nation of Islam, and any number of people who were uh, demonstrating against the Vietnam War, which of course in 1971 that was a lot of people. Um, so that so that was what that was what the program was. I mean, it was aimed at uh, disrupting, surveilling, infiltrating, and uh, in some cases discrediting people who had become uh who had gained a certain level of, of notoriety in, in, as either civil rights leaders or just just and any figure that that threatened to be uh able to m move people in terms of their point of view and and win new people over uh to a cause that the government was unhappy with um you know would be the subject of of COINTEL pro so that's the basic that's the gist that's right. And, you know, my understanding of it, obviously, I wasn't around back then and I wasn't in those groups but from the things I've watched. Uh, there were groups that knew this was going on. Some of these activist groups, they suspected it, but they didn't have any real kind of proof. Uh, so there wasn't much that they could say about it or do about it uh, up until it was exposed. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But this was not just observe and report that was going on. Um which in itself would be undemocratic, uh, unconstitutional, I believe. Uh, but it would be also disruption. It would be targeting people. It would be harassing them, trying to get them, uh, you know, basically to give up and quit. Uh, there's a famous story because it was Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, you know, the guy was having an affair at, with, again, with another woman, not his wife. Uh, somehow, the FBI got knowledge of this, so they wrote a letter pretending to be a black supporter of the civil rights movement telling Martin Luther King to go kill himself. That's what a lot of it is. It is not people in suits running through alleys, uh, being chased by black or white vans or whatever. A lot of it is very subtle, very uh, continuous harassment, disruption, uh, trying to just cause whatever mayhem they can to... Um, send the group off track. Right. So how did this, I mean, uh, you know, this went on, it was clandestine. If it was clandestine, how did this get to be widely known about, Craig? Well, um, there was a group of, of activists who were opponents of the Vietnam War who uh, showed an, an incredible amount of courage uh, in, in what they did. And they are, they're responsible for exposing it. And what they did was they broke into an FBI field office in uh, Media, Pennsylvania. I, I find I, I think it's 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 uh, kind of cool that the name of the place is Media. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, so that's just outside of Philadelphia. So they broke into this office, um, and they had suspicions, of course, that the government was was uh, you know not respecting people's constitutional rights and that sort of thing. But as you said, you know, they, they were looking for something that really exposed that and proved it. And uh, they, they stole about a thousand documents. And what they found in there was proof of all kinds of, of wrongdoing uh, by the government. It was, I think they actually probably succeeded to a greater extent than they, than they thought they would. And they, they basically found uh, proof of this, this COINTEL pro operation and 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 what it um you know what it was doing so they this is this sort of led um in fact there's a book i mentioned it in the article there's a book by a journalist uh this was back in the old days when when journalism actually tried to expose truth you know mainstream journalism some of it did some of it did and some of it didn't of course but there were actually times when uh the truth got told and um Unfortunately, I don't know that that happens anymore, but it, it, it sometimes did and sometimes didn't uh, back then. And it, there was a journalist for the Washington Post named Betty Medsker who wrote a book 
um, who wrote a book on this. And she basically uh, had covered it for the Post. And she was the first journalist to receive these documents. Because what the activists did was they didn't want to come out publicly because, of course, they had committed a crime and they could have been put in jail. So what they did was they made copies of the documents and they sent them out to journalists, mainstream journalists, a number, you know, many of them, and nobody would print the documents. Nobody, no, none of them had the, uh, well, I guess the courage or the willingness to do so. Um, but the, the Post did, did cover this and did expose what was in the documents. And that, and then other media after that followed suit and, and did so. Uh, but Betty Medsker uh, was a journalist and some 30, three years later, she was able to persuade seven of the eight burglars to uh, to come forward and to tell the story. And so she wrote a book um, in 2014 uh, that exposed it. And I can maybe get the, uh, I'll get the name for, in a, for you in a second. But um, so, so that, that was when the whole story was told. But it, it did originally lead to I mean, it was one of the factors in leading to the creation of the, the church committee in the 1970s. Uh, and that was chaired by uh, Senator Frank Church, who, and it basically looked into uh, behavior by the intelligence community against, you know, ci against citizens and violation of rights and this sort of thing. And it looked at the CIA, it looked at the FBI, the NSA, and even the IRS. And um, so that, uh, that led, that was, it was that break-in that led to the, the official uh, ending of the program back then. But uh, as we can guess, um, this sort of behavior uh, never really stopped. And um, yeah, so that, that's, that's the answer to your question, I guess. That's what led to it stopping. Now, well, it didn't stop, and we'll get into that aspect of it in just a moment. Uh, Webster Tarpley called it CodeIntelPro 2.0. Right. <clears throat> but this is a fully acknowledged program that went on. And actually, when we send out the bulletin to the show, I'm going to work it into the text, uh, a link that our audience should watch after finishing 9-11 Freefall, of course, uh, called COINTELPRO 101. It'll take you to a Vimeo channel, and this these are interviews with the activists from back in the 60s, the 70s, the people who suffered directly as a result of uh, these operations. And again, this was not just surveilling. This was not even just causing somebody to have a bad day. There were instances where people got killed as a result yeah. of the actions yeah. of the FBI. Uh, uh, headquarters would be burned down. People would be framed for crimes. <clears throat> and uh, some of the tactics may have changed over time, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, but just to highlight how this hasn't changed, some of this print's a little bit smaller here. I, I killed a lot of trees this morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, they were already dead, but I used the uh, paper to uh, print a lot of stuff. So uh, we have this from, I believe, 2009. Uh, white supremacist radio host Hale Turner was an FBI informant, as hackers claimed a year ago. And it starts off saying, while uh, supremacist radio host Hale Turner was an FBI informant, his lawyer revealed in court today the announcement and a confirmation of what hackers claimed nearly a year ago after allegedly gaining access to his emails. So basically he was arrested at, uh, for uh, calling for the killing of federal judges who uh, is a result of a gun ban that was taking place in Chicago. But the guy was working for the FBI the entire time. Now you can say, good, I'm glad that the FBI has their hooks into the white supremacist groups because they're bad. Yes, they do, but this isn't just, oh, yes, they are, but yes, this is not just... Uh, white supremacist groups, because these are targeting groups that we might be supportive of, like environmental groups, civil rights groups, the opposite side of the coin. Um, and in this particular case, you have this very violent person on the radio calling for his supporters, uh, his listeners, to commit acts of violence. The authorities act upon it and arrest him. And so he goes to trial, and part of his defense is, look, I'm just doing my job. I'm working for the FBI. This came out in 2009. And uh, 
And he was exposed, and it showed that a lot of this is still going on today. Uh, this is mentioned in the film COINTELPRO 101, uh, Betrayal in Barrio, Rafael Marrero, and the FBI Repression Against Chicago's Puerto Rican Independence Movement. And I highlighted this part. <clears throat> the FBI uh, found in Marrero a hard worker and a malleable, ingratiating person who understood the key role Chicago's Puerto Rican community played in the independence movement and in Despora. Uh, they hope to use him to disrupt, destroy, and neutralize this work. Lying about his educational and professional cred credentials, Marrero moved from Puerto Rico and settled in Chicago. He worked his way uh, close to Jose E. Lopez, executive director of the PRC and the leader of the pro-independence organization. <clears throat> and uh, basically, he did a lot of you know successful work for that movement, and he ended up marrying... Evelyn Rodriguez, who was a key leader in this movement, had a baby with her, and it turned out he was an FBI informant. Watch COINTELPRO 101. They'll go into greater detail about that. Uh, we have this, Mark Kennedy, police officer. Mark Kennedy, former London Metropolitan Police Officer, who whilst attached uh, to the police service's National Public Order Intelligence Unit, infiltrated many protest groups between 2003 and 2010 before he was unmasked by political activists as an undercover policeman. He manipulated and deceived, se and deceived several women into having sexual relationships with him uh, with the knowledge of his superiors. Here's another article about him. Undercover policeman married activists he was sent to spy on. We have this one. Uh, COINTELPRO never went away. FBI file reveals discussion of discrediting animal rights activists by planning rumors. So what you do is you just, you know, yeah. put out a lot of mishmish, as they say in Uzbek, and um, <clears throat> and try to bring people down that way, putting out false information about them, trying to use them to get them removed from their positions. Or there's another tactic called snitch jacketing, where, you know, the, the, the legitimate person is called the agent to get everybody suspicious of that person. And the meanwhile, everyone gets led to the, the actual agent's in the group. So these are just a couple of examples that I grabbed here today to show that this didn't end and it still gets exposed uh, from time to time. But, you know, only a little bit gets exposed because of circumstances or maybe some uh, very dedicated uh, people within the activist groups that expose it. Think about the ones that don't get exposed. Think about the ones that hide beneath the surface. Craig, your comments on all that? Well, I I think those are a lot of really that's a lot of good um, a good background and, and good examples of of how it still continues. Um, it it makes me think of 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 the nine eleven truth movement, of course, and uh, it makes me kind of um, I I'm never I never I never cease to be shocked at how the 9-11 tr people in the 9-11 truth movement seem to be very naive about this whole subject and seem to be, uh, you know, the, the idea that somebody might not be authentic um, is, is something that seems to outrage a, a lot of people that I assume to be genuine. Um, and, and I think the examples you're giving and the examples, I think the other ones that are in the article kind of show that the idea that the, the truth movement would be exempt from this kind of, of targeting is, is, I mean, to say it's naive is, is not even strong enough. It's, it's kind of idiotic. I mean, it's obvious that, that we are being targeted. And um, honestly, I think, I think we'd probably all be a little shocked if we knew the truth, we'd all be a little shocked at how, how badly, we're infiltrated. Um, well, hold on, Craig, because all this movement really is doing, if you think about it, I mean, all they're doing is just exposing a big mass murder that the government mm -hmm. was probably behind that would overturn a lot of national policy and change the uh, course of the future. You really think they'd be targeted over that? Well, perhaps perhaps I am jumping the gun on that. I don't know. Um, I, I think... if. if if you think you gave the example of the Puerto Rican Puerto Rican uh, independence movement, um, I mean, think of what the stakes are in that. And I'm not a I'm not I'm by no means a, a, 
knowledgeable about about that movement or the history the history of it but if they're willing to go to great lengths to infiltrate the puerto rican independence movement which is trying to get independence for puerto rico what will they do to infiltrate a worldwide movement that is exposing perhaps the greatest deception that's occurred in, in any of our lifetimes. Um, the idea that they wouldn't try to interfere uh, is, is, is ridiculous. And um, unfortunately, I think a lot of truthers, they think that it's going to be really obvious. They think that somebody that's not for real is going to be obvious. They're going to be somebody who's going to, you know, talk about holograms or space beams being used to discredit and they think that's the extent of of the the, the disruption that's going to take place but you know i don't know that people who say that, that that space beams were used are really having that significant an effect i don't know if you know they're if they're doing that much harm i think it's the people that that can derail some of our strongest evidence that uh, um are should raise concerns so um i don't know if that answers your <laughs> question or if, um but i just want to point out really quick there's a link in here that i totally missed until like a few minutes before we started recording um uh, says fbi infiltrating vegan potlucks so <laughs> well you can't you know you one day it's a potluck and the next day who knows right i mean it could lead uh it, you know, well, this was in anybody. this was in uh, Fahrenheit 9/11 by Michael Moore, where oh, the, the peace that. officer infiltrated the uh, I think it was a peace group, and it was mostly older people uh, eating cookies. Uh, he was part of the group. Then he gets killed in a motorcycle accident. One of them recognizes uh, the guy's face, but they know him as another person, right? And it revealed in the newspaper article that he was a police officer. So it was only because of those circumstances that this happened. Um, now, what's interesting, though, is that people always think that when they're, someone's trying to bring down another, that it's always going to be something that is done out in the open, when in actuality, uh, you can be more successful by doing things uh, under the radar. And I think this is even the art of war. If you can accomplish your aims without starting a war, then uh, you're even, you know, you're doing a better job at it uh, than if you start shooting. So right. actually, Deception Rules the World. I think that was the title of one of our free falls that we just did. Uh, and it's not just government that does that. It's corporations because corporations mm -hmm. run into activist problems themselves. You know, for instance, right. a big polluter company runs into activists protesting one of their dump sites, right? They got to deal with this somehow. So there yeah. was a guy... Uh, Ronald A. Duchin, Senior Vice President of um, <clears throat> McGovern, uh, Blasco and Duchin, uh, research and analyst firm in Washington, D.C., and he came up with a formula for doing this. Now, I'm not going to uh, read the entire thing, obviously. Here's the paper. I actually subscribed to a research journal just to be able to download this excerpt and see if I can find what I wanted to read here. Give me one moment. Um, oh, actually, I think the, I just wanted to be able to show this. This was a talk that he gave uh, where he kind of outlines his plan. And I found this other article that kind of tells how his plan works. And what he does, is he breaks activists into four different groups, idealists, realists, opportunists, frontliners. So the idealists uh, want what is morally best for everyone. They generally fight for what is fair and just. They want to solve society's problems. Many are naive enough, though, and may be co-opted into becoming a realist. It gets to the next category, realists. Compromise, which weakens activist movements. They can be manipulated into agreeing with things that won't promote any real change. Industry put most of their effort in converting idealist activists into realist activists. Then we got opportunists. Only care about themselves and are easily used by industry. If industry chooses to, they can appear to be any of the other three types. The opportunists will never sacrifice themselves for the cause. And then you have frontliners, uh, they're anti-corporate, do not compromise, they fight to change the system, fight for justice, and want to fix the evils in whatever area they have chosen. They are the ones most able to create real solutions. Industry fears them the most. All activists should strive to be frontline activists. <clears throat> and then it says here, 
Uh, let's see. Uh, the general framework to undo their plan and move forward. Do not work with opportunists. Show the realists and idealists that their methods will not work. Show them the frontliner views and methods are the best way to win. Um, and then learn and educate others on the Duchin formula. And they, they, there's some steps here. One of them's cut off, but it also says cultivate the idealists and educate them into becoming realists. Um, and basically ignore the frontliners who will not compromise and stand firm. So they try to marginalize the people who are legitimate and work with the people that they think that they can manipulate guilt, get into compromising, getting them to be realists, to accepting reality. Now, in the case of 9-11 Truth, what would be the equivalent of reality? You know, maybe more and more of the official story, perhaps. I don't know. Um, but this kind of leads to the next thing, because <clears throat> I've heard this name thrown around in the 9-11 Truth movement for a number of years, Craig, and you mentioned it in your article, Cass Sunstein. How does, how does Obama's former information czar play into all this? Well, um, he he co-wrote a, a paper in 2008 uh, called Conspiracy Theories, and and basically it's it's a um, it's kind of a I think it's a, a template for what what mainstream media has done with with conspiracy theorists uh, ever since, and probably some of that was going on even before. Sunstein's paper came out, but basically he, uh, you know, he talks about conspiracy theorists and theories as being, he likens them to like a contagion that needs to be contained. Um, you know, this, he talks about, and you'll see this in countless, uh, media reports, uh, you know, containing the spread of conspiracy theories, which in, it, you know anything but i mean in 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 his in this in his paper he 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 advocates anything except actually looking at evidence uh, uh concerning a particular um you know alleged conspiracy that's the one thing that he won't uh suggest doing um you know he talks about uh he talks actively about infiltrating uh, groups of conspiracy theorists, um, and, and, uh, sort of injecting, uh, the term he uses is, well, he talks about the cognitive infiltration of these groups. And what part of that involves, uh, injecting informational diversity. So, you know, he, he kind of makes it seem like it's innocent, like, well, you know, you would just go into chat rooms and, and I have a quote from the paper to that effect in the, in the article, you know, chat rooms and forums, and you would basically expose the, the, the craziness of the arguments of the conspiracy theorists. But in fact, um, he also says later in the paper, um, and maybe I can find the quote, um, he, he basically says that this kind of activity can be done um hold on i'm gonna have it in a second here from the, like break up the, from within yeah break up the What's polarized that? information break up the polarized information yeah. cluster from within yes yes so what he's what he's saying there is when he says from within that means have people essentially pretend to be 9-11 truthers if he's i mean and the most of the most of his paper talks is about the 9-11 truth movement um although you could apply it to anything i suppose so he's talking about he's advocating uh having people pretend to be 9-11 truthers and have them participate in forums and chat rooms and you know social media that sort of thing and um, inject informational diversity. Um, and so if you're, if you're just arguing, I mean, think about this, he's, he's making it sound like he doesn't admit that false information would be injected. He's kind of, he kind of skirts around that, but he's saying that, you know, you go into these, uh, you know, using social media, you go into these forums and you, show what's wrong with the argument being made by the conspiracy theorists. 
So that's fine. But if you're doing it from within, then you're basically pretending to agree with the conspiracy theorists, and then you're trying to counter all their arguments. So um, that's not the same as just being a debunker and arguing against the truth movement. That's lying to people. That's saying, well, I, I agree it was an inside job, but, but I think you've got this piece of evidence wrong and that piece wrong and, and whatever. And I think um, there is a copious amount of, in, uh, of evidence to show that this has been happening to the truth movement from the beginning. So I don't know if there's any, I, I, I don't know if I got, if I summarized the whole paper well enough there, but I mean, I, that's my initial thoughts on it, I guess. I agree it was an inside job, but most of the official story is true. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Piece by piece, because obviously someone came at you with that line, you might see them coming, but it is a different dynamic if somebody is an outright debunker. Now, I don't have any problems with debunkers as long as they're polite. I have no problem talking to them and all right. of that. The problem is, is when people are trying to uh, cognitively infiltrate and bring informational diversity under the guise of pretending to be uh, going along with our group. And it's not just the information that they bring because there's sabotage that happens as well. You know, it's when <clears throat> you pack in a bunch of uh, very toxic people into a group, for instance, let's say you're trying to just write a simple letter to uh, an agency or an organization, and it takes two years to write that letter because somebody is always objecting <laughs> to, to something. Maybe the the, the color of the uh, logo at the top, maybe the number of spaces you use between each period. I don't know, but there's always fights being stirred up and you keep everything tied up and all of this, what Webster Tarpley called rotten democracy in his presentation on the subject. And <clears throat> again, you know, they want to avoid the frontliners. They do not want to deal with somebody who sees through it or who follows a core basic uh, set of principles that uh, really, they really can't be bent on. So what they do is they try to go around them, try to go to the people around them, try to buddy up to them. And they also try to uh, work on the opportunists. These are the people, well, well, actually, we'll get to the opportunists in a minute, but the idealists and the realists, the, the people who can be manipulated with flowery language about, you know, well, we all have to be united here because of the cause. And so even if this person is acting terrible, or even if this person is lying about something or lying about evidence or whatever, you have to look past that because we're all in this together. We're all in for the cause. Folks, these are tactics that cults use to try to keep people within the group or keep them from questioning uh, the right. leadership. <clears throat> you know, being told that you're negative if you raise questions. I mean, that's no different really than being called a conspiracy theorist for raising questions about official narratives. Exactly. Uh, when you do it within a group, you're called negative. You know, you're the problem because you're asking questions. These are divisive. Techniques. Yep. Divisive. How dare you? Now, there are people that are divisive if you're raising a big stink over something that really is of little consequence. But if it's, you know, if somebody is raising a big stink over the shade of blue that's used in a graphic when it really doesn't matter... That's divisive. I mean, it's not like Dick Cheney's going to say, I'm so impressed by that shade of blue, I'm going to go surrender tonight <clears throat> and uh, admit to the entire uh, operation. No. But if somebody is lying about actual evidence, they're claiming that, uh, you know, that they were a, a, a rescue worker when they weren't. Uh, they're claiming to have some kind of government service when there's no evidence. They can provide no evidence that they actually did. Um, claiming that they saw some kind of evidence that leads the 9-11 truth movement away into some other different direction and they can't back it up and they cause a big stink when you refuse to use that, then you need to be suspicious. And then they isolate the frontliners who aren't bending to any of this. Yeah. Um, is that a pretty good assessment, Craig? What do you think? What all the stuff? A very good, that's a very good assessment. Um, you know, the whole subject of unity, uh, I mean, you know, the peop there are people in the truth movement who make this their their mantra, they're, they're, you know, they're pushing unity. And it sounds on the surface, I mean, on the surface, who doesn't want to be unified? I mean, you know, it, it's, it's better if we are. If we're all behind the same evidence and we all agree on it, that's, that's great. I mean, I think, I think we've achieved that with, you know, the controlled demolition of the towers. I think 
I think there's a consensus, a very, a very strong consensus. Um, you know, there are people who have who dispute some aspects of it, but there's nobody in the 9-11 truth movement who thinks that planes brought those buildings down. So that's good to have that kind of unity. Um, and that's why when people, I, a lot of people, uh, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but certain people have tried to kind of push me into debating with them about some of the, um, I hate to say the word fringe because that sounds like, but, um, you know, like want to get me in, involved in debating, you know, mini nukes or different things like that. And I just, I just think I don't see any benefit in that discussion because we've, we've already nailed that part of the story. Right. So, um, so in, in that sense, you know, there's, it's good, it's good to be unified about the fact that we've proven controlled demolition, but in some other areas of 9-11, if you, if you demand unity, then you basically give, um, inauthentic people the opportunity to essentially have veto power over what evidence you put forward. And you, you know, in other words, if some, if, if certain people are raising doubts about some aspect of the evidence and they are a very, you know, they're very strong and they stick with it for year after year after year. Um, and they're saying, you know, this part of the official story is true. And, and, uh, they seem to have credentials and they seem to be respected in, on some level. Uh, a lot of people, and maybe this is the idealist group that you're talking about, will will then say, well, you know, why don't we just focus on what we agree on rather than fighting over what we don't agree on? But that sounds great, except that what they're, what they're really saying is all these, you know, the areas where this group is trying to push us towards the official story, let's just not push that evidence anymore because it's it's in dispute but you know what i always argue is it's not in dispute it's a it's a very dubious group that uh, i don't think is even authentic that is pushing it so you know we're going to let them determine that we're going to take a big chunk of evidence off the table and weaken our overall case so um that's where I think, you know, this, uh, this idealist group, it, it's, it's, it's a real problem. Like the people that are, that are focused more on unity than they are on truth. Um, they may be completely well-meaning people, but they're, they're, they're not helping the cause. They may think they are by sort of trying to be friends with everybody, but they're not, um, you know, they, they, they seem to, and I've, I've had experience with this even uh, recently with my interactions with a particular 9-11 truth group in a, in a, you know, a northeastern U.S. city. Um, I won't go further than that, but um, where the idea of, of if you criticize people who are, whose behavior is very um, troubling, uh, you know, they'll get mad at you, not at the original behavior, but they'll they'll get mad at you for for causing unpleasantness. Like, um, I mean, this is working. I have to say that the uh, the efforts of 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 these infiltrators are are awfully successful because people fall for it. People fall for it because they don't want to rock the boat from people they perceive as leaders. Now, there is a certain kind of leadership role when people are in positions or they're seen a lot out there on interviews and such. But you don't want to get into the mindset where it's like, OK, I have to go along with everything because despite what debunkers and mainstream media want to claim about the 9-11 truth movement, it's not a cult. All right. Everybody is thinking for themselves, doing uh, their own work for themselves. Sometimes they get together and work together. Other times they may want to work alone. <clears throat> you don't always have to take your orders from some kind of headquarters. If some viewer out there wants to start a blog tonight, great. Go ahead and do that. Now, you can't take, like, for instance, AE911 Truth's logo and put it on your blog and say, uh, you know, eight, uh, I'm from 8911 Truth, and we think it was mini nukes that brought down the towers. You can't take other people's identities for yourself, but if you create your own logo and your own thing that uh, 
is pushing that. You have every right to do that. I'll, I'm going to think you're wrong uh, in your assessment of that evidence, but you right. have every right to do that. Now, I've said this on some free fall in the past. <clears throat> uh, I think it's good when the marble jar breaks and all the marbles go in different directions, because yes, you're going to get a lot of crazy stuff out there, but you're going to get a, generally most people trying to come at some kind of truth uh, in their research and in their writings and whatnot. And the, the readers reading all sorts of different blogs will come to some general understanding of what is the likely truth from the different sources that they see. I believe this idea of uniformity and trying to get everybody on the same page is a way of controlling activists in a movement and controlling the information that comes out. So if you build up certain figures, you know, and get them to go along with your agenda, uh, then if they come out and you know, say, oh, we should discard this evidence, you know, people are going to just kind of fall in lockstep because they don't want to rock the boat. I don't think that you need to be afraid out there of rocking that boat because at the end of the day, all that matters is what you think and what actions you do. I mean, here at 1811 Truth, we just focus on the controlled demolitions of the three towers in New York. Uh, if people want to do an actual task, they can. Uh, I'm all about actually doing work, not having a committee to discuss the committee, to discuss the committee on doing a particular thing maybe three years from now, uh, unlike some other uh, people out there. Uh, but actually, you know, okay, wh what do you need help with? Okay, write to these people. Here's a, a letter that you can use as a um, template and uh, get that done today. And then you did something, you know, maybe it does something, maybe it doesn't, but you did something and got that out there. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's how it works best. We need to be focused on actions towards getting uh, attention and justice on the issue we all agree on. And don't uh, be caught in the cult mind control because a lot of that is exactly what it is. All right. So uh, yeah. Webster Tarpley gave a speech or a presentation back in 2016 on uh, this subject. Guy with a lot of experience in this field. Talk a little bit about that. Well, Tarpley, um, I mean, basically he kind of gives a historical uh, perspective on on – Cointel Pro, not under that name, because as as we said before, that 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 name was created in '56. But but basically, government uh, subterfuge to to stop people who who are fighting against the the those in power. Um, he he had he gives a, an an overview of it going back to the 1600s, and he gives numerous examples. I won't try to recall them all, but. Um, you know, right through into the 20th century, and 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 the he he talks about the, the East German uh, Stasi, Stasi. I think I'm pronouncing that. I uh, hope so. Uh, Stasi, um, the secret police, basically in East Germany, and you know he he right up to to the present day. So, uh, and he talks about he talks a lot about the uh, some of the actual methods that they would use and how they you know, they will employ, and, and he actually said hundreds of thousands. So I guess for all, all different purposes, hundreds of thousands of people who he describes as unemployed or underemployed, disgruntled misfits. So people who can be, uh, you know, manipulated, or I guess even just, you know, paid to get into a movement like the 9-11 truth movement and and uh and disrupt it and i i can think of dozens of people that i've encountered who i i would i would bet my i'd bet my hat that they're that they're exactly what tarpley is describing um because their behavior is is too it's too consistently toxic um and you know it's too consistently toxic to be uh, to be genuine. I mean, not that people can't genuinely be toxic, but when when somebody's you know always there to inject kind of venom into any discussion, and they just and that's their job, and that appears to be their 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 mo. Um, you have you know you have to wonder what, what why would they be doing that other than they've been put up to it. And they've got. So, I don't know if I covered all. 
Yeah, they have enablers to back them up too. So if you do something, yeah. uh, some behavior that would not fly in any other kind of group of people in the world or in any workplace or any kind of uh, uh, congregation of, of folks trying to get something done, there's always someone to back them up and try to justify it. It sort of reminds me there was a comic book, I think it was the 70s, it was called Killjoy, and I don't think it ran very long, but it was a very unique premise. It was a superhero that was in a world where everything was sort of backwards. And if you do a Google search of this uh, Killjoy comic, you'll see some entertaining panels. There's one where he's swooping down and stopping a bad guy from a bank robbery or something. And there's a protester with a sign complaining about it. And the sign says, protect the, gu the guilty from justice. Um, and so people are always protesting the hero of this because he's stopping the bad guys because <clears throat> they're rooting for the bad guys. And that's kind of a, a good uh, allegory for what you encounter with, with the intentional disruptors and the enablers. They're always there to try to justify the horrible behavior and use words like negative or unity or whatnot to uh, try to lull people to sleep or get them to uh, peer pressure them into accepting that. The good news is, is that there's not actually an organization called the 9-11 Truth Movement. There's no card that you have to have punched. Uh, there's no membership fees. There's no uh, picture ID or anything like that. No, no uh, secret tattoo or handshake. You know, so there's nothing to actually be a part of. If you get into a group of people that you think there's something wrong here with this picture, you can certainly go to another one or start your own and start doing your own 9-11 activism far away from that. And that's the message uh, I want to bring to everyone. That is the good news that I spread, is that uh, you can be the leader of your own sect yeah. and uh, get something done by separating from them. What do you think, Craig? And, and don't, yeah, and don't, and don't let... Um, don't let your your respect for the credentials of somebody in the movement stop you from standing up for evidence that it is clear. I mean, I think, you know, um, when I think of David Ray Griffin, for example, I mean, David Ray Griffin was really, he was kind of what got me going in 9-11 was, you know, because his books um, do such a good job of just kind of picking at every little piece of the official story and like, dissecting it you know it it does you know he did a really good book on on building seven but his early books especially um and i think that was you know that is the approach that was uh having a positive effect but unfortunately um that got steered away um we we were steered away from that into things like well frankly the consensus panel which spent a decade in order to ratify 50 points that um, could have been, I mean, you could have plucked those 50 points out of Griffin's books and agreed to them in the first month, you know, in 2011. But we spent, you know, the movement spent 10 years um, doing that. Uh, I think that was, you know, that had the effect of slowing down our efforts quite a bit and not really achieving anything. I mean, the points are solid, they're good points and everything. But, um, you know, I think we could have um, we could have just taken a couple hundred points out of Griffin's books and then just said, you know, is everybody on board with these points? And then I'm sure the vast majority of truthers would have agreed. And then we could have said, OK, what are we going to do with this now? But instead, you know, we spent 10 years, you know, achieving very little, I think. And um and I would say, too, that, you know, that there's been such an effort in the movement to push us towards parts of the official story, but it's always done under the guise of, uh, of protecting our credibility. Because, you know, if we say something like, for example, a plane didn't hit the Pentagon, uh, you know, dare I say that uh, in public, but a plane didn't hit the Pentagon, um, you know, that will expose us to ridicule and and all the mainstream media, they'll just at some point they'll rush in and just say, you people are crazy. So we've been a lot of people have been kind of intimidated into not being willing to say what the evidence, what, what they otherwise would find very easy to say and what Griffin fi found very easy to say. 
uh, it wasn't controversial inside the movement when 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 Griffin wrote those things in his especially in his earlier books. Um, but somehow it was made into something that was controversial. It was it was made into uh, I would call a it was made into a contrived conspiracy. And I think the same thing has been done uh, to a lesser extent with the Shanksville evidence where, you know, so that a lot of people just don't even want to talk about any of that stuff anymore uh, because they feel it's too divisive and too controversial. So um, I think that has been, um, I suspect that that's a, uh, a, a deliberate thing that's been done to derail our efforts. And I think it's been unfortunately more successful than I, than I, I wish that it had been. Any final thoughts, Craig? Well, yeah, I would, I would say, you know, um, the official story is ultimately the thing that needs to be destroyed. Uh, the, the belief in the official story, because it's so obviously a fabrication and, and, you know, we're not all going to agree. Genuine people are not all going to agree on every detail of the evidence. Um, but if we're not at least showing what's false in the official story that, I mean, that's, we can have some degree of unity on that front, but if we've got a, if a, if a significant chunk of our movement is devoting its time to uh, telling us all the good things in the official story and how, you know, we really should realize how, how much of the official story is true, um, then we're, we have a problem. And if, if, if the idealists that you're talking about are saying, you know, well, we, you know, we need unity and we shouldn't really be criticizing people, then, then we're, we're really, we're pouring a lot of water in our wine. Let's put it that way at the very, at the very least. So I, I think, you know, and I think one, one little thing I'll add too, is that um, the, the, I think one way you can tell the difference between genuine truthers and, and ones that are, that are, are not genuine is the ones that are not genuine that are pushing a particular point of view seem to always be in lockstep all the time, no matter what, you won't find it. You won't, if, if a dis disagreement pops up between two of them, maybe you realize on social media that one of them saying one thing and one of them saying the other, um, I, you watch, and I bet you within, within a couple of weeks that dis that disagreement will disappear. One of them will sort of come over to the other side and they'll keep, so they'll be in lockstep. Whereas genuine truthers will agree on some things and disagree on others. You know, somebody might have a, I mean, I won't get into examples because, you know, I'll get myself into trouble, but um, you, you can, genuine people will not be in lockstep uh, all the time about, about everything. Um, and you shouldn't expect them to be, but, but there has to be a way to work together to achieve this, this goal without, without needing everybody to be in lockstep on every little thing. Um, and when, when you see people that are that way and that have a coordinated effort that goes on year after year after year, and their main focus seems to be to push element after element after element of the official story, um, even if you find them friendly, I think it's time to then, it's, it's time nevertheless to, to ask some questions. Well, Ted Bundy was friendly too, from what I heard. There you go. You got there those you go. women into those cars somehow. <laughs> Craig, thank you so much for all your great work, and thanks for coming on 911 Freefall today. My pleasure. Anytime. Hit that notification bell and slam the like button and subscribe. Thanks.